name is Leroy Jones. I am a jazz trumpeter born in New Orleans on February 20th, 1958. And I grew up in the city of New Orleans in an area known as the Seventh Ward. My mother and father, uh, they met at Charity Hospital. They were both working as orderlies there back in 1957. They got together, I guess they had sort of a brief engagement for maybe a year uh, because I was born in 1958 and uh, my father is a veteran of the Korean War and uh, my mother uh, worked in factories uh, as a young woman and uh, my mother is from New Orleans and she's also from the Seventh Ward. M my parents who were not musicians, they loved music and there was always music being played around the house. For Al Green, Aretha Franklin, of course James Brown, and even Herb Albert in the Tijuana Brass. After I would do my lesson, I, I would always get into the garage and put a record on and try to emulate uh, what I heard. Yeah. Hey, how y'all doing? Hey, Fred. Thank you, man. From, from the region, huh? Preservation Hall has been uh, in existence as a music venue since 1961. But the building itself dates back to the 1700s. The music that's played there is undiluted. It is pure jazz, swing, uh, traditional jazz. There's Pops over there, Louis Armstrong statue. One of my first and foremost mentors, Mr. Louis Armstrong. It was a great one. Louis Armstrong put this great art form that we called our American classical music on the map. He's the guy that he brought it to a place that it hadn't been brought to before and made it the international uh, the, 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 the cherished art form that it is, the only true art form that we have to offer the rest of the world. The fact that we as African Americans here in, in this city, we, we were privileged to, well, at this time we look back at it as a privilege to have had Congo Square, you know. You know, and, and Congo Square was a place here in New Orleans in the Treme that during the times of slavery that, that African, it was the only place in North America where African Americans were Africans were allowed to have drums, or slaves too, were allowed to have drums. And so the rhythms that we have now, you know, are, 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 have been carried over, you know, through the years and, and through, through, the, through the generations. And we still have a certain rhythm here. Arguably, this is where jazz had its roots, you know, and from, from a rhythmic standpoint and from just a conceptual standpoint, it started here, right here in Congo Square. Basin Street runs to North Claiborne, and then when you cross North Claiborne, it becomes Orleans Avenue. But that was the strip. That was the, the district. 
and there was the mahogany hall it used to be over there on basin street the building's no longer there but all of that was there and that that was what was known as storyville and i heard it was crazy <laughs> during that time. you know there was a lot of stuff that went on that wasn't good for young kids <laughs> The Mardi Gras Indians, now that's a different thing. Now that's something that's like more, that is Afrocentric. It's like the second weekend of March, sometimes the third weekend of March, and that's when they all dress out and they come out with their new suits and the different tribes, they meet and you know, they have all of this drama. That's basically drama. It's all about how good you look and how pretty you are, how pretty your feathers are. And there's a king and the chief, you know, the chief and there's the queen and, and you know, there's there's the spy boys and even a little bit of babies, you know, they're wearing their little outfits, you know, and it's, it's beautiful. And the reason the Mardi Gras Indians or the, the black Indians are in existence, basically they, they're paying homage and credit to the Native American, the Red Indian, who helped oftentimes gave refuge to slaves who were trying to escape uh, the, the South during the time when it was antebellum. And so that's the connection between the Mardi Gras Indians and the Native Americans. And and that because that's respect, sort of we sort of paying respect to our Aboriginal brothers and sisters who who, who were there for us, you know, for, for my, my, my ancestors who were enslaved. So we're standing in front of uh, my elementary school, St. Leo the Great Parochial School, and this is the old building of this school, and that first floor these windows here, that was the band room. That's where I started taking band and my, my band director, my first trumpet teacher was Sister Mary Hillary. And this is where it all started, right here in 1968. That's where the house was, that's 1316. That's 1320, this was 1316 St. Dennis. So it's just a lot now, it's just a lot. That was the driveway right there, and uh, that's where, where I, uh, the garage door was there, and Danny Barker pulled his car about right here, and he came up and introduced himself to me back in 1970. Danny Barker was a jazz guitarist, and also uh, he was a, a historian, uh, and he played with Cab Calloway's band in the 1930s. He's from New Orleans, and Danny also played with Billie Holiday and Dizzy Gillespie, and, and he, he played with Paul Barberin as his cousin. Now, to your right is Danny Barker's what's uh, left of Danny's house. And, uh, it's a pity that they didn't do anything to uh, refurbish it and get it together. It flooded there, and uh, that they didn't, because uh, you know, it should be a museum, uh, and it should be, uh, established uh, as, as a historical landmark. I think so, and I think a lot of other people think so as well. So Danny Barker came around uh, right in the midst of all of the things that were going on. Storyville was still, he was a little boy when Storyville was still in existence here in New Orleans, the district and so forth, and he would have been a little boy, uh, and he probably uh, checked out Louis Armstrong when Louis was a teenager even, and um, because they were basically just eight years difference in their ages. I played very loud in those days and even with the garage door closed, uh, you could hear me uh, two, three blocks away. And uh, one day Danny approached uh, me. Uh, I had the garage door up and I was practicing and he introduced himself and said that uh, Reverend Darby, the pastor of my church, is trying to organize a youth group for the church, which 
it eventually became known as the Fairview Baptist Church Marching Band or the Fairview Brass Band. And he's trying to, uh, he asked me to round up some youngsters to uh, fit the bill. I remember when I was passing Fairview Church, I baptized a man by the name of Danny Parker. And some people say Danny Parker came down here. He left New York and came to New Orleans because he wanted to organize a band. But he came to New Orleans because it's just cold in New York. And after I baptized, he said, Pastor, what do you want me to do? I said, I want you to organize me a band. I know he played a banjo, but there are kids all over the neighborhood that were playing instruments. I said, organize me a band. And Brother Parker organized a band for me known as Baby Brand Band. Those are still some of the most renowned musicians in the city of New One of the first musicians that I've ever played with, I've ever encountered, was Leroy Jones. And uh, I encountered him when we were kids, we were, we were teenagers. And um, it was part of the Fairview Baptist Church Christian Band. And uh, under mentorship of Mr. the late great Mr. Danny Barker. The garage, it, it looks like an old music store because we even had people uh, entrepreneurs who were excited about the youngsters playing this music and they would donate instruments to us and uh, Alan Jaffe who was the founder of the Preservation Hall he loved us and he would donate instruments and I was so fascinated to, to hear Leroy and because I was like you know I didn't think that there were, there were people my age who were actually trying to play learn to play jazz and to, were playing jazz and who actually understood the nuances of, of playing this particular style of music, jazz music. And uh, Leroy definitely was one who definitely had it all. I mean, Leroy could play, you know, and, and not only that, he could play the trumpet, but he also would, would sometimes, you know, we were kids and we just jump from instrument to instrument. He would jump on the, on the trumpet and then, uh, then he'd go from the trumpet and play the tuba or, or the baritone horn or, you know, one of the brasses and sound good on every one of them. Danny Barker appointed me as band leader uh, uh, of the Fairview band right away because he saw uh, that I was mature and, and I had a very uh, strong work ethic with practice, my practice regimen and, and my, he saw leadership qualities in me. And as the band was coming around the curve, I hear this trumpet sound, something I had never heard before. I mean, powerful sound, big sound. And when I looked, it was this young teenager. I mean, blowing up a storm. And so it, it was Leroy Jones who I come to find out later, it was Leroy Jones. The band, we played, we would play gigs all over the city. Uh, at one point, the Fairview Band consisted of 30 members. And so we were able to do as, like three different gigs in, in one day. And Mr. Barker invited me to come down to the rehearsal session. And that's where I formally met Leroy because I went to this rehearsal session, and there he was. I got a chance to meet him personally in his mother's and father's garage. Until that time, uh, before 1970, uh, there were no bands with young guys under the age of 18 playing traditional brass band music, playing the hymns, the old spirituals, and the, the, the brass band standards that the older bands would play. And prior to the, the emergence of the Fairview Baptist Church Band, brass band music was always an old man's type of band. I had never seen such young guys before. Getting ex exposure to uh, my, my culture, my cultural heritage here in New Orleans. And um, m my roots are, are pretty grounded in brass band music. Uh, just like Louis Armstrong, actually. Louis Armstrong uh, played with Papa Celestine uh, in the brass band, the Tuxedo Brass Band. Uh, that band had been around since late 1800s. For my meeting Danny Barker when I did at the age of 12, I probably would not have developed the passion and love for traditional New Orleans music and traditional jazz as, as quickly as I did. And so that was very significant for me as a young musician. And we're heading uh, now towards my old high school stomping ground, St. Augustine High School. 
uh, home of the Marching 100, uh, the Purple Knights. We, we were Purple Knights. When I met Leroy, man, I was in eighth grade. I was in eighth grade in high school. He was a senior. And what was crazy was, I never forget it, man. You know, I've been playing trumpet for a few years. And so we get in the, the band practice room and, you know, all the underclassmen, you know, guys playing third trumpet, we sitting in front of the guys playing first and second trumpet. So they right behind us and a tier that's slightly above us. So, man, I hear somebody warming up doing some stuff I ain't never heard. I was like, oh, 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 oh. I was like what the, what was, what is, what is, what is that? You know, I ain't never heard that before. And I literally, I literally turned around like this and he goes, man, what you looking at? I said, nothing, nothing, nothing. I was in eighth grade, dude. I, ne I, I never forget. Look, bro, and I never looked back. And I just sit there and I listen. But everything he did, I tried to emulate. Everything. I was off in the room someplace. They never saw me. <laughs> Under the direction of uh, Edwin Hampton and uh, my trumpet teacher, Lawrence Winchester, and uh, Carl Bluing, I played in the stage band there and played in the symphonic band and the marching band. But the thing about that year, though, you have to understand was it was a year of transformation for me really because of him you know because I had never heard nothing like that before I never heard nobody play even back then even to this day I have never heard nobody play with that much soul on the trumpet they turned out a lot of successful young guys uh, local New Orleanians and African Americans for that fact because you got to remember that during that time in the 50s it was Jim Crow down here in the south so the schools were not integrated between 72, 1972 and 1976, it, there was a concentrated number of talented and gifted young guys here. We were in, we were in um, the big band, you know, and we had this arrangement of uh, Chameleon, all right? And we did the final concert at the Municipal Auditorium, right? It's a big band, high school, you know what I mean? And, you know, parents out there, family members and, you know, supporters of the school and everything. The place was full. The theater was full. This guy had a two-bar break on Camellia and literally brought the house down. I'm not kidding you. When he, when he played the break, the whole building screamed, right? And what was funny was, for the longest time, he didn't even notice. For the longest time, I had a cassette of it. And I used to listen to that cassette all the time because I was trying to figure out what the, what, what was it? What? And he played like a C minor blues, see, I still remember. He played, he said, played like a C minor blues scale, right? But it wasn't what he played, it was how he played it. You know what I mean? And that's the thing that a lot of people didn't really get, you know? Also, what was amazing about that year was he never put the horn down. You know, every time I saw him, he, was, he had his horn, he was playing. For example, we'd have marching band practice, right? And I, after practice, I remember walking, I remember it was a couple of times I would walk to the bus and I'd go to St. Bernard and Broad and you could still hear him on the yard playing. And it made me feel guilty, you know? <laughs> At one point we had 32 trumpets in the section, you know, and we used to, and this is the yard where we would march. This is a whole new building here, but they still practice. We practice drills and get the shows together in this yard here. I used to follow him around school all the time, you know? And it was funny, man. I was in eighth grade, he was in 12th. So the kids in my class, they used to get upset because the, when we go to lunch, I'd be sitting at the table with them. Cause I was like this, man, I want to find out everything they do. I just, I'm gonna sit here and just listen. You know what I mean? Man, so the guys in my class said, man, you don't hang with us. And his name, they used to call him Jazz. That was his name. Yo, Jazz, what's up? And I followed him around so much, they called me Lil Jazz. <laughs> He'll tell you? Yeah, Lil Jazz, where Lil Jazz at, bro? And look, I be, look, I ain't saying nothing. I ain't, you know, I'm, I'm just like, <laughs> just quiet, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
1974, uh, the Fairview Band, we matured, then I was 16 years old. Danny Barker had to let us go. Uh, there were false rumors being spread about Danny. Uh, certain musicians, his peers, some of his peers were saying that he was using us, exploiting us for his own monetary gains. It was never true. Danny loved kids and he didn't have to steal from us uh, for his own living. And so he cut us loose. We were able to handle our affairs and he said, I'm going to call you guys the hurricane because when you come up the street, you blow like a storm. <laughs> of course, it was Leroy Jones Hurricane Brass Band established in 1974. And that band uh, basically was a slightly older version of the Fairview Band and uh, most of its members had been affiliated with the Fairview Baptist Church marching band. And um, we played the gigs, continued to do jazz fests and private parties, funerals, uh, political rallies. Uh, as a matter of fact, that's the first time I saw Harry Connick Jr. was in like 1974 when his father was running for district attorney. Uh, Harry Sr. and I was hired, the, the Hurricane Band was hired to play for one of his dad's campaign rallies and Harry was there and that's the first time he saw and heard me play. And so, if, you know, I was 16 years old, Harry was uh, at that time like seven because he's nine years younger than me. And um, of course he was playing piano already by then, you know, <laughs> I think Harry started playing the piano as soon as he was big enough to sit up at the, the piano bench, you know. I was so profoundly influenced by all of the different types of music that I heard down there. I mean, the first type of music I really heard was traditional jazz and uh, live music. I mean, I heard music at home that my parents would play on, uh, on the records and radio stations and stuff. But traditional jazz, contemporary jazz, funk music, um, you know, country music, rock and roll, classical music. It, it, it was such a vast music scene down there. For somebody like me who, who gravitated toward music, it was, it was an incredible uh, opportunity because anywhere you went, you could, you could have access to great music. about him is that when he was in high school he had his own record he had already been recorded and it was in the library at St. Art so we used to go out I used to go and put it on and listen to it you know what I mean so you know we had our different paths that we went musically but I had always kept up with him and what he was doing man you know and uh, was always amazed This record was recorded in uh, 1975, and it was done in uh, the backyard of uh, a gentleman by the name of Al Rose. And uh, it's a record that, uh, it's the first, it's my first album, actually. <laughs> the core members of the Dirty Dozen Brass Band were also members of the Hurricane Brass Band. And that was Gregory Davis, the trumpet player, Kevin Harris, the tenor saxophone player, Kurt Joseph, the sousaphone player, and Ch Charles Joseph, his brother who played trombone. The Dirty Dozen, they, they took the music to another place and began incorporating more modern jazz uh, idioms, uh, modern jazz riffs and, and, and bebop and mixing all of that with New Orleans funk. And of course, as you know, the Rebirth Brass Band came about in 1981. They came up listening and were influenced by 
the Dirty Dozen Brass Band and the ones that were even were old enough even remember they remember the hurricane and the Fairview and 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 so it's 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 sort of like <laughs> it's a generation to generation thing. I attended Loyola University for one year from 76 to 77 when they started a jazz studies program there and uh, I stayed in there for one year and then I joined the union. I was still playing jazz then, still doing brass band gigs and stuff, but I faded away from uh, doing brass bands uh, as a specific means of making my living. And so the hurricane band got pushed to the wayside. Also I was sort of getting tired of marching and I had marched for years at St. Aug and marching these back when when we we used to do second lines we would play it would be six hours we'd be out there and you played real loud and I, I was going through some changes with my embouchure and I wanted to change and, and play in a different way and get into uh, developing more of a, a playing system of non-pressure non and minimum pressure. In 1978 my first real jazz gig came uh, by way of a clarinet player the, by the name of Hollis Cormouche. He's the first person that told me that I reminded him of Clifford Brown when I see, and he gave me my first Clifford Brown, Max Roach album uh, and when I was 20 years old. Uh, uh, and uh, he said, man, check this out. Uh, this is this is who you remind me of. That's when I first started singing because nobody else in the band sang. And they would often have three bands, so it was 18 hours continuous music. 45-15, 45-15 when the, the one band finished its six sets, 15 minutes later a different band started. And business was good and uh, Bourbon Street, you know, it was, it, there was jazz on Bourbon Street. Al Hurt had his club on the corner, St. Louis and Bourbon. Uh, I was playing at the La Strada. There was the Blue Nile, the Paddock Lounge. Uh, there was uh, <clears throat> later on the Mahogany Hall. The first time I uh, remember hearing Leroy was at Mahogany Hall on Bourbon Street. That, that, that's my memory, and that was probably, I'm thinking maybe 1980, 1981, something like that. Um, he had a group that was playing there, and I kind of looked at him uh, as, as the younger generation master. I mean, there were people in generations that were older than, than Leroy that were already established, you know, like Wallace Davenport and people like that. But the younger generation, he was kind of like the young, the young hero for, for all of us. The first time I took a band to Europe was in 1982, and I was 24 years old, and we went to the Netherlands, and uh, we played in Amsterdam in the city of Gouda, where the cheese is made, and uh, we, uh, we did, it was like a little New Orleans festival. I remember, I was a grown man, I had moved, I had went away to New, uh, to New York and I moved back to New Orleans, and I'm over there by the river, by the river walk, right, kid you not, I hear a brass band playing, which is not unusual in New Orleans, but there was something like real soulful on top, right? And it stopped, and my, you know, my wife is shopping, and they trying to go do their thing, and I was like, nah, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. I, I, who is this, I, you know, because it was reminiscent, and I'm like, if this is somebody new, I gotta know who this is. And it was so soulful on top of the brass band, dude, and when the closer they got, I went, God damn it, Leroy Jones. <laughs> I mean, I went back to high school days, you know what I mean? Damn. I mean, and it was crazy, man, because he had me out there screaming like a little schoolgirl, like, woo! <laughs> My wife thought I was crazy. I'm like, don't you hear this, boy? <laughs> 
Leroy's style of playing is very unique. I, I kind of associate it with being like blazing silk, you know, because he plays so delicately, but is, is burning at the same time, you know. had the opportunity to go to Southeast Asia for the first time. I had been to Europe already, of course, and I had never been to the Far East in Southeast Asia. Uh, I landed a gig with the Camellia Jazz Band. I would sing without a mic acoustically. It was sort of like a, a brunch, a Sunday brunch in New Orleans where the, the horns, the band goes around from table to table and stroll, take requests play a birthday song here, a request for whomever might ask for something special. And it was like a real experience for me. And I had been, I changed my embouchure and I was working on that. So I wasn't in a demanding situation where I was able to play quietly. When I came back, everyone had noticed how much more my playing had gotten more profound. And uh, it paid off uh, apparently. Uh, because uh, now uh, at uh, almost practically 58 years old, I, I play the horn with, with much ease and, and endurance and durability, and, 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 and I feel that it's even getting even better. I had known Leroy in and around New Orleans as a guy who played the local circuit, but, but when I really started making records, like 18, 19, 20 years old, he, from what I remember, was living in Singapore or living in Asia somewhere, and I didn't see him around that much. And, and he had, by that time, he was kind of a, a legend to, to me and to everybody in my group. But, but I didn't really know him that well because he wasn't in New Orleans and I wasn't in New Orleans. By that time, I had moved to New York. So all of this was going on, working at the uh, Mahogany Hall, and Harry comes through, and he's like, at that time, he 18 years old. He comes in and he passed through, hey, Lee, and came and sat in. He just sat in and he said, I'm going up to New York. So he went up to New York to pursue his career. He left New Orleans about 18, he was 18, 19 years old. And uh, I didn't hear anything from Harry for a few years. Of course, I was over in, in, in Asia. And I'm watching TV. And uh, I, I saw Harry on Larry King Live on CNN and with this bass player who I, I didn't know who he was, but his name was Ben Wolf. And uh, they were playing a duet together and then there was this movie, this was 1988, and when Harry met Sally, uh, this, this, this picture was really hitting, you know, big hit in the Rob Reiner film. And Harry's doing all of the, the, the sound there, singing and playing. And, and so, uh, and, you know, I said, wow, I'm so proud. You know, I said, I know that guy, I'm sitting in there in my bed looking at CNN late one night, you know, cause the time difference over there, you know, you got, 12, 14 hours time difference ahead. Well, I moved to New York when I was 18 and I signed with Columbia when I was 18. And that's when I made my first record, but it was a solo piano record with a couple of special guests on it. And then I made another record when I was 20. And then after that, I did the soundtrack to When Harry Met Sally. And that is the record that really sold a lot of records in a very short amount of time. So a tour was booked to follow up that record. But because a lot of the music on that record was big band, and I didn't have a big band, I needed to put a band together. So that's when Leroy's name uh, sort of popped into my mind because that, I knew I needed at least three trumpet players, and, and I wanted to get I wanted to get Leroy as one of those trumpet players as my as my main solo guy. I called Winton and asked him like, who do you think I should get for my band? And then I started putting the band together and I, I didn't really know anybody. But Leroy Jones was this, you know, international guy and there, there was just no way he was gonna play with me. So I called him uh, and and got on the phone. I, I, I remember the phone call where I said, Lee, this is, this is Harry, I'm putting this big band together, you have any interest in playing? 
Uh, and he says, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. And I, I, I was just, you know, I was shocked. You know, I, I remember calling Winton after that and saying, hey, I got Leroy Jones in the band. He's like, wait, wait, you got Leroy? And because, uh, cause, you know, he's that he's that heavy. And, and uh, I was blown away. And get, getting a guy like like Leroy Jones in your band is, is like getting, you know, LeBron James in your band. Like you, you know that every single time you go out on the stage, there's gonna be fireworks. So for me, you know, a lot of the music that I wrote was written for him specifically because of his his genius. I and mean, it wasn't like no audition. I know he wants you to play. You know, Cash came up and we met in Princeton, New Jersey, where the rehearsals began in June of 1990. And then we rehearsed for about a week and we hit the road for about two months. And that was the first tour. And that band uh, was <clears throat> the, <clears throat> myself, Lucian Barbering was in the band, Shannon Power was on drums, uh, a guitarist by the name of Russell Malone, great guitarist uh, from, from Georgia on there, Russell was in that band, a uh, young man by the name of Jeremy Davenport, great trumpet player from St. Louis who lives here now in New Orleans, uh, Dan Miller, a trumpet player, young guy, Jerry Weldon, a great tenor player, Ned Gould, another great tenor player. There was a guy named uh, Josh Sturbank that played uh, alto at that time, and Brad Lely, a superb alto saxophonist. All the cats in the band, most of them, were from New Orleans or New York. I was only one from Texas. Harry said, Leroy, take this solo. Leroy started that solo and finished it. This may sound like a small thing, but to me it really isn't. Where you knew exactly like a story had been told. And that really, really changed my life. And then I realized right then, I'm in the, I'm, in, I'm surrounded by all these great musicians that have their own unique voices. And uh, Mark Mullins was also in the trombone section, uh, who's with Bonarama. And Craig Klein was in the trombone section. And later we got a bass trombone, it's Joe Barati from Florida you know, came into the band, and uh, the, the reed section, Dave Schumacher uh, on baritone sax, Ben Wolf on bass, it was a talented band. So in a big band, in a, in a standard big band, there's normally four trumpets, four trombones, and five saxophones, more or less. Sometimes you might have three trombones. Um, but normally your lead trumpet player is the person who plays uh, all of the lead melody lines and plays all the high notes. Um, the second trumpet player uh, sometimes shares the first chair with the first trumpet player uh, and sometimes plays the same notes as the lead trumpet player to give it a more powerful sound and is usually playing up pretty high too. The third chair is, is the solo chair. If you're in the third chair, that, that's kind of like um, usually your best improviser because uh, you're playing parts uh, and a lot of the things that you're playing in the big band aren't as important but you're really saving that guy up to come out and and solo so that's a really really important chair the fourth chair solo sometimes too and basically kind of supports the other three guys but it's that third chair that's that's really important trumpet three is the trumpet that plays is the jazz trumpet seat and I mean majority if not all of the trumpet solos were played by me with the Harry's band and I played trumpet three. The first album I recorded on with, with Harry was Blue Light Red Light and that came out in the later part of 1990. So we recorded that record and but we were touring We Are In Love. Now We Are In Love came after the When Harry Met Sally thing and We Are In Love Harry won the Grammy. So it was my first time at, we performed at Radio City Music Hall for the Grammy Awards in, in, in 1991, in, in February or whenever it was in 91, and he won. And, but Blue Light, Red Light was out. And by the time uh, it, 1993 rolled around, we were like, the band was hot. You know, we were playing everywhere, touring all the time around the United States, Australia, Europe. Japan. I was out and back for a couple weeks, out for a few weeks, out for a month, back a couple weeks, and then by end of 93, Harry, you know, he encouraged the people over at the Sony Music to, you know, let me, me do a record, you know, so I did More Cream From The Crop, which came out in 94. The sound that he has 
is very unique to him. Um, he was highly influenced by all of the great New Orleans trumpet players, everybody from, you know, Louis Armstrong on down. But then he also gained influence from a lot of the bebop trumpet players like Clifford Brown. Like a lot of times people on the surface will think Lee, especially early Lee, sounds like Clifford. But in, in, in order to play bebop on the level that Leroy plays it, which is different than traditional jazz, you have to have a different idea of how harmony works. Uh, and he has a very, very vast knowledge of, of how to play chord changes and how to play harmony. So it's like a, he's like a, a unique hybrid trumpet player that pulled from a lot of different places and ended up in a place that nobody really has heard before or since. Um, Harry is like a Duke Ellington uh, of his day. Uh, he knew uh, what worked, uh, what musicians uh, put together when he arranged songs. He would arrange them uh, that w make arrangements that really suited the, the, the character and nature of each musician. You know, it, it goes without saying uh, how, how much of a, a virtuoso he is on the piano. A lot of people, you know, most of the people, the listening audience, you know, they look at him as just a singer, but they don't realize how great a musician that this man is. And uh, so it's, you know, for me, it was like, it was back to school, really. I think all of us worked really hard to get where we are, and we're all serious musicians. He also happens to be an entertainer, like me. We're from New Orleans, we like to entertain people. And that's kind of a rare combination. It isn't so much for people from New Orleans, but when you find somebody who is on that level musically and also has the ability to, to want to entertain people, um, it makes for a good combination on stage. It's a testament to, to him, really, because he, um, he's just a, a, a rare combination of a great guy and a great talent. And I was the opening act for Harry, actually, in 1994 with my quintet. And I had Lucian, myself and Lucian, and Gerald French was my drummer. You know, Harry uh, is one of the most unselfish musicians that I've ever known. Uh, and to share, you know, to share that light, with, share that limelight uh, with me and give me an opportunity. And, uh, and I never asked him for it, and he, you know, he's, he insisted that I deserved it. And uh, I'm very grateful to him in, in, in more ways than one. And uh, from that point on, uh, uh, I would have to say that I think the most significant thing about being on that big band and getting that visibility with Harry uh, was that I, not only did I learn a lot more about music in general and, and, and even more about arranging and, and, and having an eye on just the inside uh, things about the music is that the people in America and the United States got to know my name. I think of Leroy as a big brother to me. Um, Leroy is uh, exceedingly bright and uh, incredibly hardworking and very, very focused. He's a, he, he is the epitome of of an artistic mind. I mean, he thinks about everything like he thinks about he thinks about his art. During those times with the big band, Harry had a very well-oiled machine, and and it was uh, the band was tight, 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 tight. We had he knew how to rehearse the band. He knew how to get the best out of each individual in the band. Every concert was usually sold out. We made appearances on the Good Morning America, the Today Show, all of this. And, and you know, Harry worked his butt off, you know, like uh, any true artist that's, you know, you know, he's ha you have an opportunity, but you have to work, you know. Well, we did the Christmas special. And also when we, we did a show on Broadway, I was like, okay, all right, this is big time. This is big time. And we would also travel 
on the Chicago's, you know, the Chicago Bulls private plane. So, and I was like, okay, okay, <laughs> pinch me now, please. We were flying MGM Grand, man. You know, it's the plane that like the, the basketball players fly that, you know, it's like a, a private 737, you know, with all first class seats, bar, service, you know. We would, we would go after the concert, instead of getting on the tour buses, we'd go right to the airport, didn't have to go through the terminal. We'd go right in and, and go up to playing like that, bags are checked in, and, you know, of course this is pre-9-11, right? And it was, it doesn't get any better than that, man. I mean, and this was happening in 1992. I mean, we were, we were flying private, a pri private jet. I can say that I, I, I did it all. I got to experience all of the best that any entertainer, any musician could. He's so smart and he's so gifted that um, there's a lot of stuff going on in, in his head. And it's kind of amazing that he's able to balance out his sweetness with this incredible artistry. Because most people who are who are that gifted um, have a tendency to not be as sweet almost. But he's just a he's just a great guy, you know. And I, I, my 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 wife loves him. My children love him. Everybody I know loves him. And then he gets on stage, and he's I mean he's you, you know you not the kind of guy you want to follow for sure. that happened for me uh, in 96, in 97, is that I met my wife, who is my wife now, Katia Doivala. I think it was uh, meant to be, uh, so we're still together after being together actually 19 years now, and and uh, we just celebrated our 10th an uh, wedding anniversary uh, earlier this month. It's a little ambiguous because yeah. I don't know when we actually first met because no. I think the first year I came to Reservation Hall, mm -hmm. but I would walk by Maison Bourbon and he was working there at the time. And somehow well, yeah. I stopped in the doorway or whatever and then I remember you, yeah, you know. wave, you know, I mean, just see, because I was playing with Wallace Davenport at that time. Uh, and I was also out like with Harry and then I was touring my own thing. My mm -hmm. The Props were Pops, Mo Cream from the Crop had come out and we, this was like, we were still between props and more cream. And then when I was home and not on the road uh, uh, with Harry or opening for Harry, I would play at Miss Bourbon as a back, not a backup, but sort of, you know, giving Wallace support because yeah. he was an older man. And, and when it was time for solos, I would play the solos. And we, we really, we accompanied him. Here we go off the topic again, yeah. <laughs> completely. Yeah, yeah but. Yeah, to but, get back to the point, I think we met in 1995. But I, I was going to get to, we just add some, some interesting <laughs> trivia. And then 97, I came back and I was a tour guide. And she had a little, I'll never forget her, her little purse with the, she had a Louis, a uh, Louis Armstrong, of what she had a Louis Armstrong t-shirt on, that's what it was. Yeah, the black with woman, and the purse, too, with, with Pops. Too, and yeah. I said, oh, you're back again, you know? <laughs> And uh, then she hung around, you know, we, we hooked up, you know, afterwards, we won't go into those details, uh, <laughs> but it was all innocent. Well, it we, wasn't can, like we can it. go into the detail of, of playing pool and somebody losing. Well, it. I didn't want to go into those details <laughs> either, yeah. You yeah. had the party at your house. Well, yeah, I, I was in yeah. Gentilly on Jasmine yeah. Street where we went. Yeah. That's right. So you invited me to the party, so then I came to the party, mm -hmm. and then we went to the Maple Leaf. It was a Tuesday, Tuesday night, night, so we went to the Maple Leaf, and Rebirth was playing. And then after that, we went to Checkpoint Charlie's and played pool yeah. till like four, four or five late. something. Yeah. And then the next morning, I was taking a group for a very well guided tour. She can shoot some pool. I didn't even know she could play billiards like she did. I said, "Oh, okay." Yeah. I went to New York and then we came here from New York mm -hmm. and that's when you still were working at the Maison Bourbon because mm -hmm. I remember it was so hot mm -hmm. 
Ja. Hvor på karate? Hvor siger man, nej, der er ikke til at finde fan. Og jeg var så like, okay. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and then I had my first trip to Finland in November of that same year. And then we got engaged two years later. March 8th, 1999. Yeah. Yeah. And then we were juggling like, should we have two weddings? One in Finland, one here. Or should we have one here and who's gonna go and how much ahead of time we need to let people know and all of that. And then as we were planning on that, of course, the 2005 nice little levy failure. So everything was up in the air after that. And, uh, but then we did get married in January 2006 in Finland. With yeah. the, in the magistrate, like yeah. a small yeah. ceremony. Yeah, just and then we had the the real shing dig here on yeah, April in year. April of 2007. Yeah. Mm. So I have a band uh, in Finland that's called the Spirit of New Orleans, and it doesn't have a permanent trumpet player except it now does. But in the beginning, he would be the featured soloist, and uh, I think 2002 were the first mm. gigs. And I mean, we had played together before that. When yeah, I played Finland with the uh, Rivers of yeah. Rascals was mm -hmm. the band she was working with before she yeah. organized her own. I think it's really nice to have a partner that's your wife and your friend, your best friend, and and who is also your colleague, and and, and we, we get to make music together and and travel together and spend a lot of time together and and. Uh, and just have a lot of things in common that we mm -hmm. enjoy, yeah. uh, even aside from music. You know, food we we like similar. You know, we we love the same. We love same type of movies. Movies same and type of TV you shows. know, I mean, I, I mean, I'm a man, but I even like the Lifetime movies too. That she likes. <laughs> I don't like Lifetime yes, movies. <laughs> but I think working together is is good in the way that I think both of us know how to be a leader when it's time for it, but also how to be a side man when it's time for that. So if it's his gig, no comments from the peanut gallery and vice versa. Well, yeah. Right? Yeah, I think, but you always kind of give a little more peanuts in your gallery than I do. <laughs> you, you really think so? Yeah. Uh -huh. you can't help yourself. It's a finished <laughs> trade, you know. We're really blessed and, and we're, uh, you know, we're happy uh, that we're now living in, in, in the neighborhood we wanted to live in and we purchased a house and, you know, we're buying a house and, you know, we established, you know, a, a lot of musicians don't have that opportunity uh, and we know some personally who are struggling and stuff. used to be buildings that were there, the bricks, the, the project, St. Bernard Project. I used to go there and rehearse with bands, cover bands, you know, as a teenager and my friends that lived there, we'd go in there and, and roam all through the projects, you know, and uh, that was our stomping grounds. Where and, did they uh, come down? Well, not long after the, the levees fell, not long after Katrina. People were displaced, just as they say, there were families that were displaced, and some would, weren't even able to come back. And uh, my wife and I lost practically all of our, uh, you know, physical possessions, you know, personal things and items that we can never replace. Uh, because when we evacuated a couple days before Katrina made landfall, we took what we could take uh, and did you have a car? We had a car. And filled, and just filled it up? We, we had a Camaro, a <laughs> sports car, so we got, took our main computers and laptop and the desktop and our main instruments that we play all the time, and we headed west to Houston and ended up in Dallas, and uh, fortunately some very kind people who have become very dear friends who were fans of ours before uh, had a place, space to put us up, but this is where 
I lived at 2710. We lived at 2710 Jasmine Street, and which during the time in this neighborhood was nice too. Nice neighbors, you know, etc. So the water there, that house took in about three feet of water, and the water was stagnant there for about two weeks because, of course, you know, Hurricane Rita came a week after, and as the water was trying to recede, Rita just pushed it back in. So, you know, there, there, there were things that had been in the back of the house that floated up to the front, and floated from the front to the back. It's, I mean, we had masks on and you could still smell the stagnation, you know. Um, it was awful. Even after six weeks, it was six weeks before we could come back to, uh, to get into the city. This is, they were letting people in according to your zip code area. This is 70122. And we came back, we left August 27th, and we came back October 12th. So we were in uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth area for six weeks back, practically. And it's these huge walls uh, that they built uh, uh, that are supposed to withstand uh, Category 3 or even Category 4. But I mean, what happens if it's a category five or category six, you know, with all of this global warming and stuff that, that's occurring uh, and scientists are predicting that hurricanes and tropical, uh, uh, tropical disturbances can be even stronger than we've ever seen before. So we'll, we'll have to see. But I'd rather deal with a hurricane than to deal with an earthquake or a tornado really I mean because you have time to decide if you're going to leave or not whereas you can be sleeping in the middle of the night and all of a sudden your bed and your room is rocking back four five feet by five five and shaking and the pipes are shaking in the wall and things are coming down so I think I'd rather deal with uh, having 48 hours to decide you know like hey I'm gonna leave. If I don't leave in 48, I'm in trouble. Certain things you couldn't get, like some fresh vegetables and stuff like that for salads and, and menu. You know, it was really, really, uh, it was so surreal being here after that. And then we had a curfew, you know. There was, you know, the National Guard, we were under martial law uh, because a lot of the police officers who lived, you know, the NOPD, they had families and they evacuated too. So there was a skeleton police force, which is why the National Guard came in and tried to keep law and order because you can keep people from looting and stuff. And, you know, well, not a lot of that occurred, you know, not as much as it was reported. You know, I mean, people say that, but I mean, if people are thirsty and, and hungry, then hey, that's what I'd be looting too to get food and stuff like that if I'm, I'm hungry and my family is hungry you know, and, and thirsty for fresh water because you couldn't drink the tap water. As a matter of fact, you know, after Hurricane Katrina, man, I, I, I had to do an interview for a major publication and I was in LA at the time and man, they caught me at the wrong moment. I was, I was tired of ask, answering these questions about whether New Orleans is going to come back and all of that stuff. So I just said, listen, man, New Orleans is going to come back because we can't stand your music and we hate your food. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. You talk to any musician from New Orleans and you tell them how many times, you know, they'll go out to dinner or take their wife or take their mom out to dinner, fancy restaurant, you get crab cakes, and what do they say? You see, that's not how I make my crab. Right? That's because we have this connection to that. That's, that's all part of our culture, man. And, and music is a big part of it. Look at how we, how we send people off, man, after they leave this world, you know? It's a celebration for us. We don't, while we mourn, we do mourn, but we still celebrate the passing from one existence to another. You know what I mean? That's, and, and that's, that's always been here, and I don't, I don't see that changing anytime soon. about the trumpet is that being from New Orleans uh, and my first and foremost mentor being Louis Armstrong, uh, I find that the trumpet has a, a voice 
and a, a sound that dictates that it must take the lead and take charge. It's usually the lead instrument, uh, especially uh, within the, the New Orleans traditional jazz uh, uh, lineups. Uh, the trumpet uh, has, has, his job is to play the melody and sing the melody. And, and I like being able to, to state the melody and phrase and, and, and deliver it and have set the, set the, 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 the mood and the tone for the other horns uh, that are playing the counter melodies and the harmonies underneath. What do you hate about the trumpet? I, what I hate about the trumpet is that it is very demanding and you really have to uh, give it some hugs and kisses every day. Uh, it will beat you down. We keep turning out great trumpet players because we don't know no better. <laughs> we really don't, man. I mean, you know, we, we don't know no better. Think about it. You know, Louis Armstrong set the tone for this town. And then kids, you see, you, listen, you could, you could walk around New Orleans today. You see kids all over the place. The rhythmic thing, the drummers and the trumpet players, they're powerful here, you know what I mean? You go down on Frenchman Street late at night, you see some little brass bands down there playing, they're playing their heart and souls out, right? And they just have a natural thing. My composition teacher, his name is Roger Dickinson. Roger wrote a piece for orchestra called Requiem for Louis Armstrong, right? And when they performed it with one of the symphonies, the principal uh, violinist of the, of the orchestra said, hey man, Roger, those rhythms are kind of complicated, man. And Roger said, well, that's interesting because there's little kids in the French Quarter that play them rhythms every day. You know what I'm saying? So it's like we, 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 they don't realize what they're a part of until they become a little old. The album's the same way. You know what I mean? It's like you talk about Wallace Davenport, Port, Emery Thompson, the Brunius brothers. I mean, you know, the list goes on and on. Henry Red Allen, bro. I mean, that you know, it's, it's, it's been a long history of this, and Leroy is, you know, another extension of that. You know what I mean? So, so <clears throat> when you come along in the city, you hear that sound. You hear that. You hear it in the street. You hear it on recordings. And you just think, oh, that's what a trumpet's supposed to sound like. So there are a bunch of kids running around this town emulating those sounds. I think it all goes back to Louis Armstrong. I really do, because, you know, he was the greatest musician probably to ever come out of New Orleans. Um, and his influence was so profound uh, that people are still trying to, you know, perform like him, play like him, understand what he was doing and how he did it. Uh, so so I think it probably goes back to, to Louis Armstrong. That's, that's never gonna change in New Orleans. The thing that may change is the style I mean, because music is supposed to evolve. Of course, that that may change, but the the, the connection that the city has to that that's never going to change. I don't think because you know we have that African tradition here of, of celebrating, you know, in, in a communal fashion. Musicians are royalty in New Orleans. They're royalty, and they should be. And I don't think it's like that in too many other places, at least in the states, in my opinion. You know, as a jazz musician. What you strive to do is to create your own voice and to go more into your own voice. And because just like, you know, the speaking voice is unique to the individual. You know, we, we, we strive so that our voice on our instrument becomes unique to us as well. And so Leroy over the years has developed, has definitely developed a sound, a sound that's definitely, when you hear the sound of, that, of his horn, it sounds like him. But not only just the sound of what he plays, the, um, the story which he tells when he plays. You know, Leroy always tells a story. And uh, that, that was, the, the, you know, that's one of the things Mr. Barker also, you know, imparted to us, you know, to tell a story when you play, you know. It's not, you know, and my uncle used to say to me, it's not what you play, it's what you say when you play, you know. And Leroy definitely has a, has a voice and, he's, and he speaks very loud and clearly on the trumpet. And, um, you know, sometimes his music can, you know, he, he plays, plays phrases that can, you know, can make you cry or make you feel happy or, you know, uh, he, he, there's so many emotions that he, that he knows how to, how to play. He, he is a genius. It's, um, there's so many things that make him unique. The fact that he practices every day. Um, the fact that he has come up in this fertile ground. And really, I mean, to say he soaks it up is 
It's an understatement. With his history to Danny Barker and the Fairview Baptist Band. Um, and of course he's checking out, as he's learning this traditional music, he's checking out all the, uh, the, the New York Cats, Lee Morgan and Clifford Brown, and devouring the music they were playing. Um, and there's an honesty uh, in his playing. Uh, and he, is, in my opinion, is the greatest trumpet player on the planet. He is the GOAT, greatest of all times. Louis Armstrong was the king, and he had the trumpet, and there was Leroy to pick it up. I played with Harry for 17 years, from June 1990 through 2000, from 1990 to 2007. If I call Leroy and ask him to come out, it's, depending on his schedule, he, 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 he'll come out and play. Um, it's not as often as I would like, and whenever he does come out, the whole band uh, realizes how special it is because he improves everybody. I mean, he just uh, raises everybody's game. You know, he's he's that he's that great, and, and and we love it. It doesn't happen as much anymore because you know he's got his own got his own thing. But I, I just relish the years that he was with the band because he he brought so much uh, credibility to me that that. Uh, I'm forever uh, indebted to him. It's really wonderful when uh, the opportunity to present itself, uh, especially for me to go out with Harry, because it's such a, a great musical experience, and he's fun to work with, and, and we have a ball together. So, uh, you know, last summer it was nice to do five weeks with him around the west and midwest part of the United States, and uh, I think a lot of the fans were excited to see me back on the bandstand together with Harry. I think everybody looks at different things. You know, there's people that don't even know I play music. Some people think I'm an actor. Some people think I'm, you know, the guy from American Idol. Some people think I'm the doctor in the Dolphin Tail movies. You know, everybody has a different sort of vision. But one thing I do hope uh, people would hear when they listen to my music, specifically with regard to Leroy, is the, the uh, extraordinary contribution he's made uh, not only to to my music but to help identify me as, a, as an artist too because his sound is is so unique and so identifiable that uh, my sound uh, has become identifiable as a result of his contribution so I just you know I think about the records that I've done with him and how, how extraordinary his performances are and I just hope people are, are lucky enough to to catch some of those. What's been his issues, what's in his heart and his soul, that's what sets, separates him, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's like something that just grabs you, you know what I mean? And it sticks with me to this day, man. Like even when I'm playing to this day, I'm 53 years old and I'm still hearing that. I'm still feeling that vibe because to me, it's the closest thing that you can get to, to spirit, you know, coming through something physical, you know what I mean? Not to get too spiritual about it, but it, it's it's uh, it's 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 that thing we all try to aspire to in our minds, you know. But but sometimes our brains get in the way because we don't allow our hearts to just too truly take over, you know. But he has that. He has that unique blend of not only being a great trumpet player, but being somebody that's connected to something way beyond us as human beings. He could go anywhere in the world. He could be in New York and he could go wherever he wanted, but he chose to stay home, right? And so he may not be on the cover of Downbeat, but he probably will one day. Uh, but all of the great trumpet players, all of the trumpet players know who he is. And to me, that's something special. I know I'll be in his life and I, I pray he'll be in my life. Um, because by that time we will have had you know almost infinite memories to share but you know up to this point I, I have countless memories of being on stage with him and and watching him play and he's sort of between the band and, and the audience when he steps out to take a solo and just the feeling of watching him kind of be in this bubble and the people in front of him are amazed and the people like me and the band are amazed too because of his uh, unique musicianship. It's just, I hope we get to live that long just to make, make more music because, you know, he's, let's put it this way, I play trumpet as, as a hobby. I, I love to play. I play every stage on, every night on stage. And every time I pick up the horn, 
my my only desire is to imitate Lee. I try to imitate him. He knows it. Everybody in the band knows it. It's something about the way he plays the horn. It's just different than anybody else. Like that's my ultimate fantasy is to be able to play like Lee. Hopefully we can set the same sort of um, feeling within the minds of the coming generation that the older gener generation left us with a great legacy. You know. Um, study the history of the music, study the evolution of the music, know where it came from, know where, how it got to the point where it's at today. Study and find out who influenced who, you know, who Armstrong influenced, uh, who um, Teddy Riley was influenced by, who Kid Sheik was influenced by. You know, these are stellar trumpet players of New Orleans who work in traditional jazz. We play jazz traditional jazz with a 21st century flavor. And I guess that that alludes to the fact that we would like the, our peers to appreciate the music that is becoming very nostalgic. It's, you know, this, mm. and, and a lot of young people, uh, I think they're not apt to go out to, the, to a music store and buy a jazz CD, especially a traditional jazz CD, but if they come and when they witness it live, and we've had people come yeah. to us and say, "Hey, I didn't realize how much I enjoy." I mean, people yeah. that know nothing about yeah. music, and they really enjoyed it because of the way we presented the music, and it and made then, them happy. And you know, just to make people feel good, mm. you know, because we've had people who even from recordings, they're like, "Oh, it's, it's been, it's made me feel so good just mm -hmm. listening to the to the recordings," and that's great. You know, if, if some of the sincerity and, and just, if, if that can transport itself through a piece of plastic, mm -hmm. that's pretty cool. about that, say the mouse. I have to go home now, see you in the spring. So the hedgehog and the mouse went their separate ways. Look at the mouse, he's, he's waving goodbye. Ada, he's waving goodbye, and the hedgehog is waving goodbye. See the hedgehog, he's waving bye. Yes, yes, he's waving, bye-bye. My wife and I had a baby girl born on February 5th, and uh, her name is Ada, and uh, she has just added so much joy to our lives. Uh, <laughs> to, to my surprise and my wife's surprise, uh, we were blessed with a little boy uh, by the name of Luca, who was born this year on March the 15th. For the most part, it's, it's easy, you know, I mean, but, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's a handful when you have to, you know, like one on, if it's just one of us and you're trying to cater to both of them, you know, and the dog, you know, it's like, okay, time out. <laughs> Time out, Ada. You know, this is what we wanted. And, and now that we're, you know, both of us, and especially myself, uh, I'm not on the road uh, like I was, you know, 25 years ago. And, and, you know, it's really, it's really nice to have have these little spirits in the house, and it, it brings a lot of joy to us.
hopefully she'll uh, remember her childhood as, as a fun, you know, a fun, safe time with, with uh, you know, it seems like when, when you're young, you have, all you have is time and you just get to do all cool things mm -hmm. and, and don't feel uh, rushed and, you know, hopefully she'll have nice friends and nice, uh, nice everything. Mm -hmm. People always say, oh, they're going to be a musician. No, they, we don't know that. I said, uh, but they will appreciate music even if they don't become musicians. I think everyone should appreciate and, and find enjoyment in, in music and art. If I had to say anything, I just would, would hope that she, uh, that, we, that we did a good job of uh, steering her in the right direction and that uh, she, she's appreciative and that she maintains her humility and, uh, and that she, she is uh, kind. <laughs> Free at last? Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. I love my family and the babies and my wife and everything, but everybody needs this space, man. How y'all doing? Hi. All right. The gentrification has started in the city of New Orleans. And it, it has occurred here in, in, in the Treme, in the old part of Treme and around neighborhoods, around town, elsewhere. Uh, in some ways, it's, it's been a good thing. Uh, the neighborhoods have become safer to a degree, but in another way, it's taken away from the essence of what makes, uh, for example, Treme Treme, what makes New Orleans New Orleans. It's almost like, taste, it's almost like taking the seasoning out of a, a pot of gumbo and just having it just a little bit bland, you know. Uh, there's a certain ingredient that needs to be in, 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 in the food and in the, in the blood flow of, of the neighborhood that keeps it unique and keeps it raw. I tell you what, having the two babies around our house has not really altered anything for us uh, because it has been a desire of our hearts. Of course, we've had to make some sleeping adjustments, uh, and I always wanted to have a family. I always wanted to increase the family numbers, and uh, just I see myself and, and my wife having so much love and 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 compassion uh, that it would be selfish not to share that with another human being. I hope that I'm blessed to live to be 90 or 95 or 105. Uh, I hope that I can still bring the horn up to my lips and play. Uh, I think uh, if, I, if I don't get to do that, uh, it would make me very sad. I just hope I can live long enough in a, a ripe old age to be able to watch my children grow up and see my grandkids and watch them grow up even. And, and if they're inspired by anything that I've done, uh, it would be a joy just to witness that. documentary film on him.